Good morning, everyone. I'm hoping you enjoyed your 4th of July celebrations and festivities. And it's good to be here and worshiping with you this morning. Pay no attention to the screens. Just pay no attention to the screen right now, <laughs> and the man behind the curtain, or the woman on the clicker, as the case may be. So did you miss us? We were gone for two weeks. <laughs> Jesse and us, all, the whole gang, pretty much. So we enjoyed uh, family camp. It was wonderful. And uh, I tell you, if you didn't make it out to camp for one night just to listen to the speaker, you missed a good speaker. He's excellent. Wonderful guy. Lots of knowledge about the Holy Land. And, and so anyway, uh, so yeah, it's the 4th of July weekend, and we've had a great time celebrating already, I'm sure. Um, and so we want to celebrate our freedom and uh, the fact that in Christ our chains are gone and Amen. we've been set free. Uh, our Savior has ransomed us. So let's, uh, if you are able, let's stand together. Sing a little Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Father God, we come into your presence today and we thank you for sending your son Jesus to ransom us, to set us free. And uh, it is like a flood that your mercy reigns, and we're so grateful for that. Thank you for your unending, unconditional love and your amazing grace. Amen. Amen.
See the shining sea. Yes. Amen. Yes. Uni unity. Unity of purpose, even with diversity of people. We're all different, but we should be in the same. Yes. Yes. Same purpose. All right. Well, God so loved that He gave His Son. <coughs> he is the one who set us free.
Day and every day. Okay. Hey, you guys. Um, you guys like uh, fireworks? Did you get to see fireworks? Yeah. Did you get to see them? Twice. You went twice. Yeah. We went last night over to Barnes Lake. It was really cool. Now, we had to wait a long time because we had to wait for it to get dark. Now, why do you think you have to wait for it to get dark for? Fire light, you're right, you're right. It's like light, and you need a black background to see it, a dark sky to see it. Hey, here's a scientific thing for you. Did you know that there is no such thing really? Well, let's put it this way. Darkness is not a thing. Darkness doesn't really exist. Darkness is the absence of light. So the less light you have, the darker it gets. So darkness, it's kind of like they like to say black isn't really a color, it's the absence of color. That's kind of weird, isn't it? Okay, but think about darkness as the absence of light. So we have to wait for it to be dark so when the fireworks go off, we see a lot of bright, uh, bright stuff in the sky. Now, listen to what Jesus said. He was at the temple one time, and he was teaching some people, and they, they weren't getting it. They weren't understanding it. Um, and uh, so he, he had something to share. I'm going to put that up. It's your fourth of July. Okay, he, uh, he had something to tell them, uh, lots of different things he told them, but this one, I like to remember is this. He said, Jesus spoke to them again. I am the light of the world, he said. He said, I am the light of the world. It's one of seven I am statements in the book of John. I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. So you walk with Jesus, and he lights your path, and he shows you which way to go. Uh, so we need to remember that uh, whenever you are in a dark place, you find yourself in a dark place, and you're like, God, are you here? Just remember, if you have Jesus in your heart, he's with you, and his light will shine out of you. Um, he, he even said to us, he said to his disciples, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine. So he is the light of the world because he's in us. We are also the light of the world. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Just don't blow up like, it, like uh, fireworks, okay? We don't want to do that. Did you get it? Got it? Good. Okay, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for these kids. Thank you for uh, each and every one of us uh, that you light our world no matter where we are. Whatever dark place we're in, you can be there with your light and shine it into us. And then let, may your light shine out of us as well, especially for these young these youngins. They go into schools and uh, with friends and games and whatnot every day. And uh, they need your light to guide their way. So guide them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys can head out. All righty. Oh, having a couple family matters to share with you. Uh, like I said, we had a wonderful day, uh, week at camp. 
multiple days, just uh, Sunday to Sunday, some great teaching, uh, wonderful music, and uh, this, uh, this week, starting today, is Covenant Hills Family Camp. And if you want to catch a speaker out there, you could drive out there. I think their services start at 7 every night. And so you might want to go catch a service or two out there. If you go early in the week, then you'll decide if, oh, yeah, I want to come back and see some more. So I want to encourage you to do that. And look up Peggy. Peggy, what site are you going to be on? 349, and she's got a couple of California kids with her today. So there'll be seven grandkids. That is Peggy's purpose, it, it, she's discovered that her purpose really is to, um, to minister to be Jesus to her grandkids. So if you didn't know that, you know it now, okay? Or why would she take seven grandkids to family camp at Covenant Hills every single year? And what, Jordan, you've been going what? All your life. He's pretty much, he can't remember a time when he didn't go there. So every, every uh, July, uh, Dad flies him out here. And is, is your mom and Dad out here with you? Yeah, okay. Okay. Well, we're glad that you're here. You were last year, I think, at Christmas time, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, and you sang uh, Let There Be Peace on Earth the last time you were here, I think. That was awesome. Well, we're glad, uh, glad for that, and so I just wanted to encourage you uh, for that. And uh, So pray for Peggy this week. It might be a little tiring, uh, so, but they have a lot of great kids' programs, so she ha all she has to do is get them up and move them, feed them a little bit, and send them out, and they have a great time. So there's a ministry opportunity coming up this September. A grief share group is forming. Uh, it'll be probably the end of September, and it'll go to the beginning of December. Um, there are video topics, and then some sharing time, talking about it, how does it relate to you, topics like, um, obviously, sadness, but also anger, uh, some other feelings that you deal with as you grieve. You go through the grieving process, you know. Uh, you might be angry at God, you might be angry at the person for leaving. I mean, it can be all kinds of things. And uh, we need to talk those things out. And some of us as Christians have, have worked our way through it, and that is awesome. But remember, there are people out here that don't know Jesus, and they really, they really get into a pit in their grief and find a hard way to get out. And so this is going to help people get out of, um, you know, to, to maybe get to the point where, well, I don't like it, but I can handle it. With God's help, I can handle it. Okay. So let me know if you are interested in that. Helping host it would be wonderful. Um, so let me know if you would like to help host that. It's probably going to be a, an evening, I'm thinking a Monday night, 7 o'clock, that type of thing. Okay. Now, two weeks from today is community worship at the Veterans Pavilion at 1030. So we're not going to have a service here. I need to verify that time, but usually it is a little bit earlier than we have service here. So get down there early. Get a, get a seat. Maybe bring a lawn chair if you want. Um, they have plenty of seats there in the pavilion. Uh, if the weather's nice, people will sit outside and around. Um, so this is community worship. The, um, uh, maybe the United Methodist Church will be there, will be there, the Spring of Life Church uh, there as well, and uh, perhaps others as, as we invite them. Um, so keep that in mind. So if you come here on that Sunday and you're like, the parking lot's empty, what's up? Well, there will be a sign on the door to remind you, but uh, just head that way. Before you get to Mayville on the left, you'll see um, the museum grounds and uh, there's the Veterans Pavilion right there. Okay. Oh, So tithes and offerings. Uh, offerings have been going well and uh, even with low attendance. So if you're catching up because you missed a few weeks, uh, catch up. It would be a big help as we get through the summer. And um, we're using the box in the back under the fire extinguisher. So don't put any matches in there because we can put them right out with the fire extinguisher. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's take a moment to pray about that. Lord, I do thank you for our church. I thank you for this family of God um, that supports your ministry here at the church. We pray, Lord, that each giver would be blessed uh, beyond comprehension, Lord. Uh, your, your word tells us that if we will just bring a tenth of all that you've given us, bring it into the storehouse, 
which is your house, Lord, that you will open the windows of heaven and pour out many, many blessings upon us, more than we could ever count. Thank you, God. To your name we pray. Amen. So, today I want to talk to you about facing opposition. And what's the Bible say about it? Facing opposition like Jesus did. Obviously, we want to do it like Jesus did. Now, if you'll turn in your Bibles, if you have your scriptures, turn to John chapter 7. We're going to be in there in just a moment. Um, but do you remember a time when a group or a person opposed you? Have you ever been opposed? Somebody who stood against you, who tried to stand in your way, put a roadblock in front of you uh, to keep you from doing what you know God wanted you to do, you know? Um, so think about that. Remember a time when somebody or maybe a group opposed you. Now, here's, here's a, uh, a supposed ancestor of mine, uh, David Crockett. He, this was his motto. No, I, I read his, I read his um, biography when I was a kid, having the same last name. And people always ask me, uh, Pass, uh, Bruce, are, are you related to Davy Crockett? And I usually say, well, I don't think so. I wouldn't be caught dead in the Alamo. <laughs> but, um, Boom. Psh, where's my drummer? <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't be caught dead in the Alamo. So I don't think we're related. But he said this, I leave this rule for others when I'm dead. Be always sure you're right, and then go ahead. So I remembered that. I saw that in the biography. It said, be sure you're right, and then go ahead. And... For some of us who, who lack confidence, sometimes we, we kind of, what? We have the same nose, do we? Really? Oh. Uh. He's got a little more hair than I do, right? But he didn't live as old as I did. Um, and so anyway, uh, but be sure you're right and then go ahead. Some of us lack confidence even when we're right to know that's the right move to make. It's the best thing for the long term, but it's going to be hard in the short term. So, but I need to go ahead. Of course, there's a caveat that goes to that. Um, be always sure you're right, then go ahead, but be willing to admit you're wrong if it turns out you're wrong. Sometimes that happens. Uh, and so in humility in Christ, we will be able to admit that, uh, that we're wrong. Okay, so be sure you're right, and then go ahead. I like that. Um, good old Davy said that. Um, but see, if you want to do what God wants, and if you want to live the way God wants you to live. I mean, if you want to stand for God's truth, you will face opposition, the same type of opposition that Jesus faced. And people have been opposing God since Adam and Eve disobeyed him in the garden. Uh, people hate God sometimes. sometimes. They hate God because he calls evil out for what it is. They will hate you if you stand up for the good ways of God and denounce evil actions of those who rebel against God. Why all this hateful opposition? Well, sin calls evil good and good evil. A scripture even says, woe unto those who call evil good and good evil. You know, that's, that's the opposite. That's, that's, that's the devil's approach is uh, to call the good things evil and the evil things good. You can think of a few things that we're seeing in our society today, I'm sure, where uh, God calls something evil, but it, it is being lifted up as something good that should be celebrated. But God knows our actions, and he knows that our actions are either good or evil. People, well, I suppose there have been evil people in history, uh, but they're evil because they did evil things. And some, some are so steeped in evil, your Stalins, your Hitlers, your Mao, that, that, uh, that you're like, yeah, that, that, that person, you know. But usually it's, what, it's our actions. God loves everybody unconditionally, but he hates sin. So he's going to hate if we sin against him. He will hate it because we've done evil. We've done the opposite of good. God wants us to do what is good. Um, I love this. Sometimes we feel like we should flow with the current, but remember, a dead fish can flow with the current. It takes guts to swim against the current of the world. So more and more guts to do that. Okay, so let's go to John chapter 7, and uh, we'll read a little bit through here. We're going to see how Jesus faced opposition and who he faced it from. 
So after this, Jesus traveled in Galilee since he did not want to travel in Judea because the Jews were trying to kill him. So they're 100, 120 miles north of Jerusalem. They're in the Galilee area up by the Sea of Galilee. Um, he's, he doesn't want to go down into Jeru to Judea anymore at this point in his ministry because there are Jews there that are trying to kill him. Um, and his time has not yet come. All right, so the Jews, the Jewish festival of shelters was near. It's also called the festival of tabernacles. Uh, they, this festival was a week-long festival, September, October time frame, and it lasted a week. Um, the people had these festivals to remember things from their past. Uh, we just had 4th of July. We look to our past and appreciate our present and our future because we look to the past. And it's, it's worth studying what our founding fathers believed in and how they trusted in God and how they believed uh, in Christ. Um, you know, it's a myth that many of them were deists. I, man I imagine some of them believed that they were deists. Uh, but I tell you what, deists believe that God existed, exists, started everything up, and then kind of stands back with a hands-off approach. Uh, well, if, that's, if they were all deists, why did they, including Jefferson, repeatedly call for days of prayer and fasting? One of the reasons why we, uh, you, could, you could count at least two miraculous weather instances where um, the, uh, the, the entire Continental Army could have been wiped out if not for the fog and the fog that, that fogged in the, the British while the, American, while the Continental Army left the Brooklyn area, went across the river, and so they, you know, they, were, um, they were saved because, um, because the, the British waited until the fog lifted. The Continental Army didn't have the fog. They could, they could go and do what they needed to do. So anyway, so that's just one example, and that came right after a time of prayer and fasting called for by the leaders. So the tabernacle, uh, the festival of shelters, of tabernacle, sometimes called booths, or it's hard to say, festival of, I like shelters, that's good. Um, the, the people would build a temporary shelter and stay in it for a week. They'd camp out, like you guys are going to do a family camp, you got your tents, even your camp, your trailer is a temporary shelter, and so it's kind of like the feast of shelters. And so they would build these things on their roof. They would, they would put some poles up and maybe some palm fronds, and they would stay in that for a week uh, as they enjoyed the festivities, maybe even in their backyard. You know, if you ever camped in your backyard, you kind of know what that's like. Uh, let's check out the tent. Let's get the kids out there and, and, and uh, camp in the backyard, just to kind of see how it goes. Well, they would do that for a week. The reason they did that is they were remembering the 40 years that their ancestors wandered in the wilderness. When Moses led them out of Egypt and they wandered for 40 years through the desert, uh, living in temporary shelters for 40 years. Well, this is, is a remembrance uh, festival. Most of them are. Passover, that's another one. And, and so we tend to look at the present and look to the future, and uh, the past is okay as long as it doesn't get in our way, or we'll redefine the past if we don't like it, right? But... Um, the, bi the biblical approach and the Jewish, the Hebrew approach is to look to the past, learn from it, celebrate it, learn the lessons, and live accordingly. Be grateful for what God did in the past. Okay? So that's, that's kind of a, a, a little side thing, but it's important that the festival of shelters was near. And so his brothers, Jesus' brothers, the ones who were related to him, the men who were born after him to marry, in other words, right? His brother said to him, hey, leave here. This is Hicksville. It says that in the scripture. No, this, is, this is where all the hillbillies, we're all hillbillies, but you know, hey, if you want to be, if you want to be a public figure, you need to go down to where the action is down in Judea. And so they kind of said that. They said, hey, leave here, go to Judea so that your disciples can see your works that you are doing. You know, the people in Judea aren't seeing these miracles you're doing. Go down there and do them. For no one does anything in secret when he's seeking public recognition. Jesus, aren't you seeking public recognition? 
Well, don't you think it's time to leave up here and go down there or up there? If you do these things, show yourself to the world. And then verse 5, for not even his brothers believed in him. Wow. So here's one of the couple, three references that we have in Scripture to uh, the siblings of Jesus. Um, so Mary giving birth to Jesus, um, and then through with Joseph's, you know, with his with her husband, then she had uh, brothers. She had his brothers and sisters. So they're basically half brothers, half sisters, right? Um, you can find reference to his sisters as well. So uh, that's that's kind of an important aside, but see, not even his brothers believed in him. And what did he say? He said, look, my time's not yet arrived. Your time is always at hand. You can, you can, go, to G G G you can go to these festivals anytime you want. Things are heating up for me. I can't go there now. The world cannot hate you, but it does hate me because I testify about it. I testify that its works are evil. Go up to the festival yourselves. I'm not going up to this festival yet because my time has not yet fully come. After he had said these things, he stayed in Galilee. So off go his uh, brothers and disciples, and they head down to the Feast of Shelters in Jerusalem, and Jesus stays up in Galilee for a time. So Jesus, the Messiah, faced opposition. The first one was from his family. His own brothers didn't believe that he was the Messiah. They recognized his miracles. They saw what he was doing, but they were like, hey, you know, you're becoming a public figure. If you want to really be a public figure, don't, you want fame, you need to go down to Jerusalem. You need to go down the, into Judea where, it, where it's all happening. So he was first opposed by his family, and we see that. Family sometimes does oppose us. Um, but as I put in your bulletin, Jesus refused to take his show on the road in search of fame and fortune because God's timing matters. Jesus was totally in tune with the timing of his father. Has your family ever opposed you for doing God's will his way? It would eventually be the father's will for Jesus to go to Jerusalem, even during this feast of, of uh, shelters, but not yet. The timing so we do, we want to do God's will his way. We want to do the right thing the right way, don't we? Because um, God is a God of order, he's, he's, and he has a plan, and his plan is for us to follow his plan. Uh, we commit everything we will that, that we do to him, and then our plans succeed because our plans are basically his plans if we commit everything we do to him. And so people you love may try to hold you back. Um, I just watched a documentary last night from uh, about Celine Dion. Now, Celine Dion, I've, I've uh, never really bought her, her albums, but I've really appreciated her, uh, well, her ability to belt out anthems and perform. She doesn't just, some, some, some per let the song speak for itself. She really performed it. She was quite the performer. So there is a, a new video out. If it, it's on uh, video, Prime Video, if you have Prime, if you have Amazon Prime, you can watch videos on there uh, for because you're paying for video, you know, Amazon Prime. And so anyway, so I see this. It says, "I am Celine Dion," and I'm like, "I know." <laughs> I sound kind of prideful, the title, but I'm like, but it's a, the picture of her is she's 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 quite elderly now. She's she's looking like the rest of us who get up in age, right? Um, the short version is this. As a child, she began to sing. She loved to sing. She lived for music. She was one of 14 siblings, 14 children. So she had 13 brothers and sisters. Their family was big into music. She started singing at the age of five, and people thought, man, you're, you're good. Uh, one time she stood up at a wedding for her older brother, and I think this is when she was young. She was five, and uh, she tells the story about how uh, the band is playing behind her, and she's singing a song, and whenever the guitarist played a wrong note, she'd turn and look at him like, what are you, what, you know, 
calling him out for it, and, and her mother said, look, you know, if, if anything goes wrong, just keep on going. You know, don't, don't, don't look at somebody when they make a mistake. Just, just keep on going. And so that kind of became her plan. If anything went wrong, uh, she just kept right on going in her performances. So uh, eventually, um, she is supposed to go to Las Vegas and have a residency there. So she has a home there. She's living there. And uh, she was going to do a performance, an ongoing performance thing there in Vegas. Uh, and then she canceled it. And she put a video out. And she talks about how uh, she w has been diagnosed with um, stiff body syndrome, SPS. Sin stiff body syndrome is where your muscles begin to tighten up. And they, they spasm. Sometimes her foot will spasm or her hand will just get so tight she can't open it up. And her therapist will open it and then it'll come back and she'll open it and it'll pop back until she gets through that. It's, it's made worse by stress, even good stress, the stress of performing. Um, she started to notice that when she would, I mean, she's getting up opposition from her body here is what I'm trying to get at. Her body is starting to betray her. In the morning, day after a show, one time, she's warming up, she's starting to sing. Usually in the morning, singers, we know this, we can sing bass, we can sing a lot lower in the morning because everything's relaxed and we haven't used it a whole lot yet. She started to notice she would talk, she would sing and it would be kind of low. The next time she would, s and then she would take a breath, then, then it would go up, it would go up. Instead of her voice going down in pitch, it kept going up, up, up and she couldn't stop it from happening. So vocal cords are muscles. You have to work them. So she had to work them, but if she w overworked them, and she really wasn't over singing, it was because of this disease. The disease started stiffening up her vocal cords. So she would go to sing a song. Sometimes she'd be on stage when this started happening. She'd be singing a song, and she could feel it coming on, and she would go like this to the audience, and they would sing the next line. They would sing the next verse. Sometimes she'd even call them, let's sing that last one together. Uh, and they would sing it. She was covering for herself. So she even says, you know, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't cancel uh, concerts anymore. I, I, I can't be lying about having a sinus infection or, or, or a throat infection or anything like that. I can't, you know, I need to tell you all the truth. And the truth is I have this disease. And so... I miss you, I love you, but I won't be able to be with you on stage. And so this, this if you get a chance to watch this movie, it is very touching. It's about an hour and a half, and it goes from her life, what it's like today, with her therapist working with her, stretching her muscles, working with her, and her talking about singing, and then they, they're showing clips of her concerts when she was younger and how she's belting it out and everything. It just it really is touching and amazing. So she's really working. I think one of the saddest things was, was toward the end of, of the time, um, she goes back into the studio to record. You know, she's had like a couple years of physical therapy, and they're working with her, and her muscles aren't too terribly bad, and so she seems to be getting a little bit better. She wasn't falling down anymore. Her feet weren't locking up. But uh, she goes into the... Uh, You've, so you, you've ju you just watched this. You, you've just listened to her in her prime, and now she's in the studio trying to record a new song. And, it, you know, if, if you're a singer or a musician, even if you just love music, you'll cry because she is trying to sing this song, and her voice is occasionally there. Sometimes she had to stop. She started over umpteen times. No, nope, let me try it again. Let me try it again. They recorded it. She came back the next day. She listened to it. She goes, that's... That I, don't, I don't like that. That's, that's not good. Let me, let me try it again. So she tries it again, and eventually they got it, but still it's just a shadow of her former self. Um, you know, but she feels that that's what God made her to do, and so she's going to keep trying to do it no matter what. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a quite an encouragement to persevere. Your family betrays you. Sometimes your body stands against you from doing what you want to do. Um, can be lots of different things. You back problems, migraines. You know, you get a migraine when you least want it. Um, they even filmed one of her whole body 
I can't call it a seizure because when people seize, they bounce around, but her, her whole body locked up. And, th and they kept asking, do you want to shut off the camera? And she didn't want the camera shut off. But wow, that'll get you too. So, so, but Jesus was opposed. He was opposed by his own family, and that must have hurt a lot for him. He was also opposed at the temple. And so among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Now, they said three different things about him. Like, well, you know, he's a good guy. He's a good man. Others said, no, he deceives people. He's deceiving people. He's trying to get them to think he's the Messiah. And then the crowd sometimes said, you're demon-possessed. You know, who, who's trying? You say people are trying to kill you. Who's trying to kill you? You're demon. You, you've got to be crazy. You're, you're deluded. You're, nobody's trying to kill you. Oh, well, yeah, they were. They were planning it all along. So Jesus, to the crowd at the temple, was, was either a good guy, or he was a con man, or he was crazy. Maybe demonically crazy, but they thought he was um, <laughs> Looney Tunes, right? Now, C.S. Lewis unpacked this for us, and he said this. He said, um, you can't say Jesus is just a good teacher. He, he isn't just a good guy. In fact, the worst thing you could say about him is he was just a good guy because you're denying his sonship of the Lord. And so C.S. Lewis said Jesus is either a liar because he claimed to be God or is a lunatic because he claimed to be the son of God and he wasn't, you know, like somebody who says, I'm the queen of England. You know, we don't think that's very uh, uh, sane thing to say, right? So he was either a liar, a lunatic, or he is indeed the Lord. Those are the three options. He was either a liar, or he was a lunatic, or he is the Lord. There's no other options. I mean, um, and so ask yourself, do you see Jesus as simply a good teacher who modeled how we are to live? He, he certainly did that, but that's not his identity. The Son of God, okay? And then you can read on in John chapter 7 that on hearing his words, some of the people said, well, surely this man is the prophet. He's the Messiah. Others said, yeah, he's the Messiah. Still others asked, wait a minute now, how can the Messiah be from Galilee? Because, you know, they're supposed to be from Bethlehem. I mean, the scripture, does not the scripture say the Messiah will come from David's descendants, which he did, and that he would be from Bethlehem? He was born in Bethlehem, wasn't he? The town from David, the town where David lived, of course, all they could think of was the fact that he's from Nazareth, he's, he's based in Capernaum up in Galilee. He can't be, he can't be the Messiah from coming down here from Galilee. I mean, he talks like a Galilean. I mean, he talks like those, those hill people up there. So thus the people were decided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Um, as I've read John 7 and 8, uh, you know, and I have, let's see, is this a red letter? Yeah, this is a red letter Bible. How many of you have a red letter Bible? And even you version on your phone, you can tell it to turn on the red letters. You can have it activated. And I like that, but uh, it kind of draws my attention to the words that Jesus said. And in this case, I missed the, the, the fact that he was being opposed over and over and over. And it kept getting worse, even by the religious leaders, they opposed him. Um, so... Usually when you preach from these uh, areas, you know, you're probably going to preach about, you're going to talk about, you're going to look at, what are the words that Jesus said? Like, I am the light of the world. You know, he said that. He said, uh, he stood up the final day of, of the festival and said, um, you know, come to me, all you who are thirsty, and I'll give you living water. You'll never thirst again. Uh, what did he mean by that? You know, he could have a whole message, maybe even a whole series about the living water from Scripture. But what John is doing here is he's showing us how Jesus faced and how he dealt with all this opposition. John chapter 8 is very telling because the, the religi religious leaders are challenging him back and forth, back and forth. They get into this argument about Abraham and where the, 
you know, we're children of Abraham, and said, well, no, you're, I have, he, he's arguing back and forth with them about this, and they're just not getting it. And they said, well, how do you, uh, where, where was it, the end of chapter, uh, actually, I've got it on the scripture right there. Your ancestor Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. The Jews said to him, hey, you're not even 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? You're talking like you know Abraham, like you've seen him. And Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. I am is the name of God from Scripture. So before Abraham was, I am. Wow. That's that's. Declaring himself God, the son of the son of the Father, right? And so they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. He was able; he was able to uh, fade away. Time wasn't right yet, so he got away. Before Abraham was, I am. He had no choice but to, I guess, even rile them up even more, because he kept stating the truth. He just kept stating the truth. Sometimes we have to do that, don't we, when we face opposition. I like to think that he did that in a loving manner. He discussed it with them. He tried to explain to them. The whole chapter of John chapter 8 is is all about that. Uh, Interchange between these religious rulers, trying to get them to see how blind they were, and they wouldn't see it. And finally he just said, you know, when you talk about Abraham, hey, before Abraham was, I am knowing that they were going to try to kill him. So when you get to heaven, you might want to check out that video and uh, stream it so you can see what happened there. How did you get away, Jesus? You know, it's kind of like, there was a couple times when he just sort of disappeared. He kind of like, where'd he go? You know, they were ready to stone him. Maybe they turned around to find stones and they looked up and he's gone. I, I'd like to know how that happened. That'd be kind of neat. All right. So here's, here's the bottom line. The application is this. Like Jesus, discover your God-given purpose in life. What's your God-given purpose? In this season of your life, perhaps, what's your God-given purpose? And then live out your calling with confidence because you are right where God wants you to be. That's what Jesus did, right? And that's what he wants us to do. Discover our purpose for life. And live out your calling with confidence because you're right where God wants you to be. How to you discover your purpose in life? Well, if you have a life scripture, a verse that is your, that you're like, God gave me this one especially. When I came back to faith in Christ in my 20s, the verse he gave me was, if the Lord set, if the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. If the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. So what I would do for my life purpose is turn that into a mission statement and say freedom. I'm supposed to help God set people free. You know, that, that, the fact that I found freedom in Christ makes me want to help other people find the same freedom. I get excited about that because that's my life verse and I turned it into my mission statement. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lead not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him. Many of you have that. So trust, how do you make that into a statement? My purpose in life is to get more people to trust in Christ and lean not on their own understanding because they think they're smart, but they can only go so far. They don't, they don't have all the answers. Nobody does. But would they trust in the Lord and, and not lean on their own understanding but acknowledge him as, as the true God? See, it's, it's easy to do. So maybe you don't have a life verse yet, but you know, you know, I don't know if you have a life verse about your grandkids, but what happened at one of these family camps was, a, I think it was a speaker talking to you about what's your purpose. And, you know, before you had grandkids, you, your purpose couldn't have been to raise your grandkids, but, <laughs> in, or to, you know, to lead them to greater faith in Christ, but that is now your purpose. So, uh, and, and you've been very faithful to that, and God's blessed that. And so, you know, find out what your purpose is and live it out in confidence. Live out your calling. Uh, you 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 be, be called. Well, one of our at-home moms is 
well, both of our at-home moms are outside, but if you're hearing this, you guys are called to be at-home mom. So live it out with confidence, right? Yeah, that's our calling for their season in life. Jennifer and Michelle are both at-home moms. That's kind of unique in our society today. That's a calling to, ra to be home for your kids and raise them. That's hard. It's, uh, financially, it's difficult for people. It hasn't been easy, like I know for Nathaniel and Jennifer, uh, just living on here. But y the benefits pay off. We it was it was tight on us. We became house poor when she quit her job to have to have kids and and raise them. In other words, we couldn't afford other things because we could afford our house, but not much else on my salary. Even though it was, even though by, uh, 30 years ago it was still way more than I get now, but we're happier. Okay. So let's go to prayer. Let's pray about this, and let's pray. We're not going to have a song today. We're just going to go right into prayer. I have a couple of prayer requests. Um, um, Nathaniel, we want to pray for his poison ivy to go away. And uh, you may not know this, but he's also been laid off. for the, This is the third week in a row. The timing is actually perfect for family camp. So God's hand was in that. He was going to take a week off without pay. Instead, he's got a couple, three weeks off with, you know, you'll get unemployment eventually. Uh, so that, I, I see that as God's hand at work. <laughs> the layoff was kind of a blessing, yeah. But you're bivocational pastor, so you got to get back to work, Right. Kathy Bueller came home. Oh. Wow. How cool. He is. Is it nice of you? Wow. Mm -hmm. He responded and said, what, forgiven and done. Forgiven and done. In other words, finally gave my heart to Christ. Yeah. So we have Martha Lauren. We have Bob Haas. Both of those have cancer. What? Bev O'Neill. Yep. Let me write her down. Continue to pray for Bev O'Neill. All right, let's just go to prayer. and We'll lift these up to the Lord. But, Father, we're, you're, we're so grateful um, that you have shown us how to stand up against the opposition that we will face. Uh, Jesus, you did it. Uh, we can only hope to do it as well as you did. Um, but... Uh, we are encouraged to know that because you were in God's plan, you did face opposition. Uh, you faced it in the wilderness when Satan came after you, and you faced it uh, for with people, even those who were supposed to love you and believe in you. They didn't e believe in you until after you rose from the grave, your, your own family, Lord Jesus. And so uh, we know, Lord, that we'll face opposition, and, and we take comfort in the fact that if we are facing opposition, that perhaps that's an indicator that, that, uh, that we are on the right path, that we're on your path, because um, that is when the opposition should come and will come. But, Lord, we want to lift up some folks to you today. Uh, first, the family of Jeff Woodward. Uh, Jeff passed away Friday, and uh, he was Cheryl's, um, oh, Peggy's, Peggy says, uh, okay, so Peggy does, Jeff is, was her nephew, which is also Cheryl's cousin. Uh, so we lift up this whole family, uh, Peggy, Cheryl, and the rest of their family, Lord, as they grieve his loss. Um, be with him in the funeral. It'll be this week, I imagine. Um, we praise God, Lord. We praise you for Kathy Brewer making it home. Having been paralyzed, she's been rehabbed, and she's back home. How What a great answer to prayer that is. Another person passed away, Bob Burmeister. Um, died on the 4th, and the family of uh, Tom Harmon as he passed away yesterday. So, Lord, these two families, 
Burmeisters and I don't know, is it Carmen? Um, Lord, uh, they are going to need your touch. And to know that you are with them and your comfort and the peace that only you can grant through the Holy Spirit, Lord God. Um, we also live up to you, to you some folks who are struggling uh, with cancer and with illnesses. Martha Long and Barb Haas, um, Dean Bedell, Becky, a young mother with breast cancer. Uh, Lord, these ones with cancer, Father, um, their bodies are betraying them. They're opposing their will to live. And so we ask that you would uh, intervene and bring healing and wholeness, Lord. And we know the best healing will be when they go to be with you in heaven and they receive her, their new body. But, Lord, uh, bring the healing as you see fit. Uh, may this cup pass before, you know, be taken from them, but nevertheless your will be done. Lord, and our sister Bev O'Neill, Lord, she's been uh, home struggling um, as her mind is, is betraying her and opposing her in a sense. And, and so be with Bev and Mike and, and the rest of the family and caregivers. Uh, but we lift up Bev to you, Lord. We love her, uh, and uh, we, we ask, Lord, that you give her clarity in, of her thinking. Um, help her not to be confused. Give her, give her Lord, um, a special touch. In, in her mind and in her heart for you. And I do lift up Nathaniel to you, Lord, as he's uh, getting over poison ivy. We thank you for that. But we also thank you, Lord, that your timing is, is good. We don't always understand why these layoffs happen um, sometimes, but the timing of this is not coincidental. And so we're, we're just trusting you, Lord, that things will all work out for this young family. And so be with Nathaniel. Help him to get... Uh, back to work and and uh, to to learn more and more there as he as he works in this IT field. And we'll thank you, God, for hearing us, Lord. We thank you for blessing us. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God who cares and gives us peace, even when we face opposition. We can have the peace that passes understanding. When we should be panicking, we can have peace in you, Jesus. So give us that. We ask it. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, let's stand up for a second, if you will, for a blessing. Here's a word from Jesus. Speaking of red letters, this Jesus said these things to each and every one of you. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Amen. And we are dismissed.